This is People and Their Poems, a podcast about the poems that make a difference in our world, hosted by writer and educator Sandy Carlson. Welcome to People and Their Poems podcast. I'm your host, Sandy Carlson, and I'm here today with Margaret Hunt of Litchfield County, a seasoned educator, a lifelong reader, and an enthusiast about education and literature, and a graduate of Smith College. And I am so delighted to have Margaret, who is also my personal friend here today, to talk about poetry and why poetry deserves an audience. Welcome to the podcast, Margaret. Thank you, Sandy. And don't forget that we taught for a year together, and it was my pleasure to be teaching with you for my last year of my career. So my pleasure. Oh, thanks, Margaret. Well, you and I both taught poetry in our year together, and, and it was the big stuff, too. We, we looked at the Odyssey, uh, and we taught it to freshmen, and we found it relevant. But before that, you had plenty of experience of, of teaching poetry. So I'd, I'd like to talk first about the question, why is poetry relevant? A lot of people think it's a hard literary form. It's for the, the ivory tower few, for the brittle teacups of literature. It's relevant for all of us. Why, why is that? When I was planning my senior English poetry elective, when I taught at Pomperog High School, I depended on two poets and their essays. The first was Dana Joya, who wrote an essay, Can Poetry Matter? in his book, Essays on Poetry and American Culture. I met Dana Joya at the uh, Hillstead Sunken Garden Poetry. He was one of the readers one summer, and um, they had a practice of having the poets that came do workshops, and you could sign up for the afternoon workshop and then stay on for the poetry reading later in the, in the afternoon and evening. And I was just so thrilled to listen to Dana Joy. He talks about his growing up um, in, I don't know, Brooklyn or somewhere with his Italian mother. And, and he talked about how important just reading was. Um, but this essay that he wrote is, is really wonderful. In a way, he reminds me a little bit of Billy Collins, one of our former poet laureates, because the idea is we need to bring poetry back to the people. And not get it stuck, as you say, in the elite, in the academy. And why do we need to bring it back to the people? Well, he has a couple of really great sentences in his essay. Um, I have absolutely marked up this essay, as any good reader, teacher type does. Um, and he, he really brings it, there are two, at least two reasons why the situation of poetry matters to the entire intellectual community. The first involves the role of language in a free society. So I find this particularly appropriate today. Um, poetry is the art of using words charged with their utmost meaning. A society whose intellectual leaders lose the skill to shape, appreciate, and understand the power of language will become the slaves of those who retain it, whether they're politicians, preachers, copywriters, newscasters, we could say social media influencers, we can add that in. Um, so I, I think uh, this is about the power of language and poetry is about language condensed. Um, unlike novels and plays, uh, and s which is about explosions of language. Poetry, the way I think of it, is about condensing meaning into the words so that the words carry so much more than just what they look like. That's why a short poem is, a, is, is really tricky because short poems aren't necessarily short reads. <laughs> so, and then his, his second reason why the situation of poetry matters is that poetry is not alone among the arts in its marginal position. And, and if, if we lose poetry to a little subculture of specialists, he calls them, what happens to the, to the common people and their access to language? 
So he really speaks at the end of his essay to the importance of poets giving public readings, like the Hillstead, like the open mic that we went to down in Washington at the pantry the other night, um, taking their poetry out into the public so the public isn't totally scared. Um, uh, poetry teachers, especially at high school, should spend less time on analysis and more on performance. We need to liberate, this is him speaking, liberate poetry from literary criticism. Yeah, let's just bring it back to the people. He says, poems should be memorized, recited, and performed, and the sheer joy of the art should be emphasized. So that's a lot, um, but I think that poetry matters because ultimately, um, at the end, he says, um, let's get it out of the academy and out of the its prison in an intellectual ghetto, there's nothing to lose. Let's build a funeral pyre. Here's a great image, this last sentence. Let's build a funeral pyre out of the desiccated conventions that pile around us and watch the ancient spangle feathered unkillable phoenix of poetry rise from the ashes. So yes, poetry can matter. You know, Margaret, um, just that selection that you read made me think of Billy Collins' big project or one of his big projects when he was poet laureate, which was to put po poetry in public spaces on buses, on subways, yeah. so that you would see it. And also his Poetry 180 website, which was which he developed mm -hmm. so the students would read a poem a day, not analyze, not take it home for homework, but experience a poem a day. And yeah. that that's a truly, truly powerful experience. And even our, our current National Poet Laureate, Ada Limon is working on getting poetry in national parks and integrating language with that experience of our 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 other national treasure, which are our parks. You know, and our national parks have poet in residence programs, and it's not just for painters; it's also for writers. So, yeah, let's bring the poetry out out to the people, out to the public places. I used to have my students in this poetry class bring in a poem. Each each student would have a day and they would bring in a poem, any poem, and they would read it to the class and and just to get the words in the air and to demystify. Because, again, I, I think poetry is scary. There are teachers who are scared of it and and there are plenty of non-teachers, students who are scared of it. So how do we make it accessible? And, and how did how did your students respond to the experience of having the task of finding a poem and presenting it as well as being an audience to a poem. You know, once we got going, it was great. And of course, I had all these random poetry books in the room that they could look through. And you know, honestly, I think one of the one of the perks of this assignment was that they didn't just open to a page and just pull out a poem. They ended up looking and reading various poems. So they, unbeknownst to themselves, expose themselves to more poetry, even as they were just looking for one to read. Um, and it was fun because different students would choose different types of poems. And I think just that little piece showed them that there is no one thing that a poem is. It doesn't have to rhyme. It doesn't have to have a set rhythm. It can, of course. Um, you know, one of my first little exercises was really, what is poetry? And I gave him a little sheet of paper with a whole bunch of different structures and words on it. And I said, so which ones of these are poems? What And why do you think so? Um, and it was kind of eye-opening to them because they all thought, oh, well, poems have to rhyme. You know, that's right. just that's just what they do. Poems rhyme. You know, maybe they have four lines, groups of four lines, and that's just what they do. But so it's about expanding the concept of the word po poem. Um, and so then you come into why should we even write or read poetry? And that took me to a powerful essay by um, a poet named Carolyn Forche. And she has written a book called Against Forgetting, 20th Century Poetry of Witness. 
she's the editor and she wrote the introduction. Her her thesis is really that poems bear witness to things. And some of the terrible things that have happened in the world, we need to know about, we need to hear about. And she talks about the Holocaust poets as a, as a perfect example of, um, she starts her essay out with an anecdote about a, a Hungarian poet who was in one of the forced labor camps in 1944. And he had a little notebook and he wrote his poems in there. And uh, the fact that his poems survived and he didn't really bore witness to what was going on. So the notion that a poem can have a job, I mean, that's a fairly serious job, bearing witness. Poems can be for fun, you know, the, the Edward Lear, is that his name? Have I got that name right? Who wrote those funny poems about E.E. Mm-hmm. E. E. Cummings, who plays around with form and writes about grasshoppers that jump around, and so do all the letters on his page. Poems can make you laugh. They can be light. They can be lyrical. They can be about beauty of nature. Or they can be right down and serious about, hey, there's some things in the world that we need to know about and not forget. Um, so really, it's 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 a huge cultural communication tool, don't you think? I, I do. I tell my students all the time, the first texts were poems, the first stories were poems, and they found their music, yeah. and they were heard and remembered. And, and also, I think, coming back to one of the first things you said was, poetry is a social experience, and was meant to be. It was meant to be sh- shared in a public setting. You know, and and that it told everybody's story in some way, and not not that it was jingoistic. We you, we know our epic heroes are are cads and fools with plenty to learn, and and we go with them on this journey of learning in a public way, and it's it's an exciting adventure, even if we know how it's going to turn out. I think the interesting part is is what happens when students turn from reading a poem after experiencing several poems to, to writing them. And, you know, if they work within a form or not, this, this idea that every word is, is fraught with meaning and they need to choose very, very carefully. That process itself, regardless of the outcome of the writing exercise, is what English class is about, about being accountable for your words and, um, and choosing them carefully. Sure, sure. And of course, in this era when rhetoric is such a tool, um, both in a positive and a negative sense, having students exposed to uh, the power of language and giving them the power of language. Once we got through our discussion of, can this be a poem? Could this possibly be a poem? Who writes poems anyway? I had a little article that was from Sports Illustrated. And it was about a, a baseball player. And he his name was uh, Miguel Batista. And he used to write poems in the corner of the bullpen when he was playing Major League Baseball. So what what is a poet? Is there a, Do we have this image of what a poet should look like and what a poet should do? And here's a, a Major League Baseball player who writes poetry. So I just kept trying to bring to my students the fact that poetry isn't just, isn't up there on some mountain or something. And so the next thing we moved to was Uh, We read poems about poetry, and that's where you get Billy Collins and his wonderful poem, which I think you're familiar with, uh, An Introduction to Poetry. Yes. Oh, yes. Tying the poem to a chair and beating the meaning out of it, which is just really great. And then you get that wonderful poem by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Constantly Risking Absurdity which just flies all over the page. And it's it's really, he's creating a metaphor of a poem with a high wire artist and the audience of the high wire artist. And, and the high wire artist walks carefully across his, his line, line would mean line of poetry. So, so we look at that one. We looked at a pair of poems One's called a How to Eat a Poem, where she she compares a poem to a juicy piece of fruit and you bite right in and you let you let it drip down your chin and um, you don't need a knife or a fork or a spoon or a plate or a napkin or a tablecloth. You don't need any tools. Just 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 let it let it be messy 
And then the other poem that goes along with that one is, it's a Japanese poet. Her name is Naoshi Koriyama. And her poem is called Unfolding Bud. And she talks about how one is amazed by a water lily bud unfolding with each passing day, taking on a richer color and new dimensions. So that's her first stanza. And her second stanza, one is not amazed at first glance by a poem, which is as tight closed as a tiny bud. And then her third and final stanza, Yet one is surprised to see the poem gradually unfolding, revealing its rich inner self as one reads it again and over again. So the concept of reading and rereading and expanding understanding, and these are all tools of good readers also. So then I would send the kids off. We have a couple of more different ones um, to go find their own, uh, go find a poem about poetry. And they have a lot of resources and places to look. And that's, so they bring in their poems about poetry. And we, we talk about them and we talk a little bit about what makes them work, what they like about them, uh, favorite lines. And then the assignment is to write their own poem about poetry. So you're asking me, so how do we get them to write poetry? So you give them a lot of models and you, mm, you demystify it and you tell them they can have fun. They can be messy. And so that's that's a fun, that, that's kind of the opening unit of the, the course on poetry. I'm sure you've done some things like that with your students where you give them a model, model pieces of writing, and then you, you set them off and you give them a sense of their own, you know, the big buzzword these days in education, student voice. Yeah, yeah, go, go for it, you know, and maybe model, use one of these as a model. If you're a little nervous, that's perfectly fine. We copy and steal all the time, right? <laughs> so we, we do. And I, in the, in the class that I teach, the author who comes to us at the end of the year, of course, is Shakespeare. Somehow you get all the other stuff out of the way and you make way for Shakespeare, you know, and, and the kids really enjoy the sonnets and, and I, I find it really amazing to watch, watch kids, you know, if you, there's the 14 line structure, there's the rhyme scheme, mm -hmm. but also there's the structure of argument in those 14 lines mm -hmm. and I, it becomes a roadmap for understanding. And just, just those few little pieces of information can be enough to feel like, okay, I got this guy, I can do this. And, and students then write their own sonnets. We might loosen up on the rhyme scheme requirement, but they get to a place where they're saying something significant about their lives and how they see life. And, you know, you use some words, they're like messy, mm -hmm. fun, mm -hmm. and what do you like? These are, these are ideas that don't generally come into the English classroom. You know, it's all about the heavy analysis and, right. and things that are very serious and dour and this premise that it's all beyond you. And there is a right answer. Remember that there is a right answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and poetry is the way out of that because I, you know, the, some of the poets you, you named chiefly, I think Billy Collins, he's not going to let you stay on the pedestal or let you with the English teacher hide behind him, um, yeah. to impart difficult lessons. He's, he's, he's reaching for his audience immediately. And then I think poetry is demanding that immediate connection that we can't interfere with. Yep. And, and so the, the, this course, which was a one semester course, culminated in a slam poetry performance. So we're bringing poetry to an audience. So I had them watch a film about a high school, a black high school in Chicago, where they put up a slam poetry team. So they learn about what exactly is slam poetry. Um, there's slam poetry here in Connecticut, here in the Northwest corner. So I would bring in some of those poets to talk about slam and what it's like. There's a teenage team from this area that goes to the nationals sometimes. So just to expose them to that. And then they um, work in teams or they can write on their own because in this film, the each slam poetry team had several presentations. They could have a solo slam presenter. They could have a teams of two, three, or four. So they, they got so many different divisions, right? So the, the students had their choice. Did they want to write with a group of three people? Did they want to do it by themselves? 
And then I called in a friend of mine who is a local slam poet, Sandy Sandra Ebner. She lives here in Litchfield, and she was the judge. So we really did this. We had a performance. Um, if I'd really had more time this first time through to get it going, I would have tried to do it something that would have had a school audience. But this was the first time, so it was really within the class. So the, I had two sections, and if if one section was free when the other one happened, they could come to, come to watch that. Um, and then we had um, the way uh, little local slams go. You have people in the audience with their little whiteboards. And at the end of the performance, they write a number and they hold up the number. So we had, a, a, you know, some of the students would be judges for the for the day. And I videotaped them. And uh, and then Sandra would would give her judgment on them which was always very positive she's wonderful um and then they would would watch the video i still have the videos and that must have been i don't know eight years ago and they're wonderful so they wrote they picked their own topics and some of them wrote about um teenage romances some of them wrote uh, i had one group that wrote about climate change eight years ago it wrote about the environment, um, whatever was important to them. Um, and no topics were off bounds. So so I think they got a sense of, and, and they had fun. They had fun. And we'd have practice sessions where they'd, you know, they'd work on their writing and then they'd go off in the corner and practice. Um, so bringing poetry out of that, as Joya says, that intellectual prison because it's tended to be sent there. And I think we as English teachers have a real responsibility to, to bring it back. And, and our poet laureates, God bless them, are doing just that, I think, our national poet laureates and our locals, because you're a poet laureate in Woodbury and, and you're doing that very same thing for Woodbury, um, which I think is fantastic. Well, well, thanks, Margaret. In the summer, we had our, our, our poetry open mic with a baseball theme, and it, it actually brought people out as couples. Mm. And you could read a poem you wrote or a poem you liked. And because what I realized was a lot of times this becomes this sort of siloed thing where uh, open mics are all about the writer getting some airtime versus the engagement piece. And one of the featured poets said at the end, when was the last time you saw people leave, leaving a uh, poetry open mic smiling? Because, you know, because it, they can be kind of dire and, and serious, very solemn, you know, and it was, it was just exciting to see people connect through poetry, through a topic. But um, back, back to your class, though, I'm just curious, when, when the kids at the high school took your class, did they, did they say what, drove them to that elective versus anything else they could have taken at Pomparag? Senior English was structured as a series of electives. So it wasn't elective all by itself. It was a choice within their senior English. So they all had to take senior English, but they could put together two semesters of choices that were offered. So poetry was offered, Shakespeare was offered. There were some novel studies offered. So this was one of the offerings. The first class I had, I remember at the end of it, because we all do, we do a little questionnaire at the end, like, especially with the new course. So this was the first time I taught it. You know, what worked for you? What did you enjoy? What would you say to someone who might ask you, is this course worth taking? And one of my students uh, said, I just signed up for it because it kind of fit my schedule and I wasn't really committed to it, but you know, we have to take senior English. So I signed up for it. Um, and he said, but I'm really glad I did because I I have learned so much and it's been so useful for me to think about language and its power. And basically he said, I really surprised myself by liking it. <laughs> so I thought that that's pretty good. Uh, that's a pretty good response if you ask me. And you know what else, Margaret? I think, I think when we believe our students can learn, and we believe that we have some something to offer, and we can make great content available, just open the doors to where to find out those great things. Kids can do it, and they want to do it. I have we ever met a a student who really didn't want to learn, you know, or walk away with something more and better? 
that they could do it through this this art form of poetry and that you got them there it just just inspires me as you always do well one thing i added as it became a little bit more academic if you will was now you as we got into the poetry of witness and against forgetting each student so this was an independent project had to choose a poet it, it couldn't be an american poet it had to be a poet of the world because the notion of senior english was about global voices and so we're looking at global poetic voices in this in this um iteration in this last unit but the only requirement was that the the poet they chose had to have some connection to them and I found that many of my kids had um, a legacy or what do I want to say back in their family tree uh, I had one gentleman uh, who had a, a Hungarian relative so he wanted to do a poet a Hungarian poet I had uh, you know a French background for some of the kids but they had to have some connection reason for choosing this poet and it couldn't be a united states american poet it could be a poet writing in english many of them actually chose poets they had to read in translation then they had to learn a little bit about the poet's life and then based on the forche essay carolyn forche essay against forgetting what was it that your poet didn't was bearing witness to didn't want to be forgotten so it could have been, it didn't have to be some dramatic, horrible, historical crisis moment. It could have been bearing witness to family or to moving or to the landscape in which the poet grew up. So lots of room for choice, which allows the students to follow their interests, I think. And I think that's important. So that was fun. I had a young man who chose Rilke, um, who to me is, mm. but this was a very philosophic fellow, this student. And, and a lot of these poets I never even heard of, which is also the beauty of it. You know, they are finding their own private poet and they're teaching me and the rest of the class about their poet. And how cool is that? You know, when we, the teachers are learning from our students. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I have a lot of poetry books that I would never have if my students hadn't found these poets. So I, I think it's, it's, it's important. And you know what? I say a short text, don't be fooled, but it, it is in the time that we have with students in the classroom, um, instead of trying to get, to get through an entire novel, because you really can't have any final thoughts about a novel till you see how the novelist left us. How does it end? But with a poem, your text is generally much shorter. So it's a different kind of time, but you're not taking the time to get through the text. You're taking the time to get down into the text, which I think is, is also a useful skill. Um, you know, digging deeper and not just skipping across the top. So, so that's something I hadn't thought about until I actually taught a whole poetry course. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a perk, a possible perk of teaching poetry. You're not up forever trying to get through the novel yourself. <laughs> so. Great, great thoughts, Margaret. I want to, I want to thank you for continuing the process of demystifying poets um, for our, our listeners and for the teachers out there who are you know faced with teaching poetry and might be somewhat intimidated to sort of share the share the road with their students. Uh, hopefully they'll be uh, inspired to do that. And so thank you so much for taking your time on People in Their Poems podcast today. Oh, it's been a real treat. Thank you so much. A great way to spend a rainy afternoon, Sandy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. And you are. This has been People and Their Poems podcast about the poems that make a difference in our world. Be sure to check the show notes for any special links relating to this episode. If you want to learn more about the podcast, visit peopleandtheirpoems.net. Or if you want to learn more about Sandy and her work, visit sandycarlson.net. Thanks for listening.